So I think it's time that we we went back a little bit to advance us forward is what we need to do and look at reclaim what is our birthright. And through working with Susan, I've learned we are wired for art. I mean, that is the way our physiology is wired. So the fact that we've pushed it aside or only the people who think they are good at it do it, we want to change that myth. You have quadrillions of neural pathways throughout your brain that connect all of the different systems that create multiple mechanisms. So how do you process learning? How do you process memory? How are you creative? How do you even move your arms and legs? How do you create emotion? All of those things happen because of these neural pathways that are created in your brain. Turns out that the arts and aesthetic experiences are the most salient types of experiences because they create meaning, they create a sense of purpose. There's things that we remember. Mm. So, which is why it's so easy to remember your favorite song when you were 13 or your favorite color. Um, These things create almost a fingerprint, an autobiographical imprint on your brain and body that become who you are. Welcome to the Good Life Coach Podcast. I am your host, Michelle Lamoureux. The intention of this show is to awaken you to your fullest potential. Join me each week for inspiring interviews to elevate an area of your life, as well as interviews with women entrepreneurs who are creating success on their own terms. Each episode provides actionable tips to guide you to design a life you love. Hey friends, it's Michelle Lamoureux. Welcome back to the Good Life Coach Podcast. You are in for a fascinating conversation about the healing and transformative power of the arts. Joining us today is Susan Magsamen and Ivy Ross, who are the co-authors of Your Brain on Art, How Art how the arts transform us. It's an incredible book. So fascinating. I marked it up as I was going along and highly recommend it. Um, Susan is the founder and director of the International Arts and Mind Lab Center for Applied Neuroaesthetics at the Pedersen Brain Science Institute of the John Hopkins University School of Medicine, where she's a faculty member in the Department of Neurology. She's also the co-director of the Neuro Arts Blueprint with Aspen Institute. And Ivy is the vice president of design for hardware products at Google, where she leads a team that has created over 50 products, winning over 225 design awards. An artist with work in over 10 international museums, Ivy is also a National Endowment for Arts Grant recipient and was ninth on Fast Company's list of the 100 Most Creative People in Business in 2019. Welcome, Susan and Ivy. It's so honored to have you both here today. We're thrilled to be here. Thank you. Really a pleasure. Thank you. Well, since this is an auditory experience, I thought it'd be nice to have you just both in your own words describe what you know a little bit about what you do and how you came together because i'm hearing uh neuroscience and aspen institute and and google and i mm-hmm. and i wondered how that came how, how that came together um susan do you want to start and then ivy go so people have a sense of who you are Sure, I'd be happy to. Well, I think we all know that life is not a straight line, um, lots of zigs and zags and and twists and turns. Uh, So for me, about, um, oh gosh, 2017, uh, I was uh, asked to um, really start to think more deeply about how to build this field called neuroaesthetics, which is really just how we study Uh, the brain and body on um, the arts and aesthetic experiences and started to reach out to what we have called luminary scholars in our lab Mm. to learn more about what they were doing kind of in the wild, in the, in the, in the community. And so we invited uh, folks like Benj Pasek who wrote La La Land and Dear Evan Hansen, um, uh, uh, other Nobel prize winners who had done really great work in looking at sensory systems. And uh, I wanted to uh, work with uh, Ivy Ross. And for years, uh, I followed Ivy's work. Uh, She was the head of the girls division for design at Mattel. 
And about the same time, I had uh, been building a company called Curiosity Kits that that developed hands-on learning materials for children in, in arts, sciences, and world culture. So I knew about her work, and I knew about how innovative she was in bringing teams together, using creativity, really helping them to be creative and also create things that were really imaginative for others. And so I reached out to her on LinkedIn. And, uh, you know, it's really a cold call. She calls it stalking, uh, but I, <laughs> it's okay. It's not like I haven't done that before. Um, and so anyway, uh, you know, I wrote her and I said, hey, I'm doing this work showing how the arts measurably change our brains and bodies and um, would love to talk to you about that. And so she wrote me back almost within, you know, minutes and said, uh, hey, this is really cool. I'm really interested in this. and could we talk for 30 minutes? You know, could we, could we schedule a call? And, um, and we did, uh, and we thought it'd be a 30 minute call. It ended up being a three hour call where we really just, uh, kind of batted back and forth all the things that we were so excited about and how the, by the science really beginning to inform what we understood about the neurobiology of the arts, what that could mean for the future. Uh, so maybe I'll turn it over to Ivy from there. Yeah, and I have been um, an artist and a designer, and I also minored in psychology, and my hobby is wellness. So all of these things married together, when Susan um, told me what her lab was doing, I'm like, oh my God, finally the public can understand um, what really happens when you're engaged in, in these various arts. So Susan and I decided to have in my living room in Mill Valley, California, a salon between artists and neuroscientists. And it was kind of curating like Noah's Ark. We had you know, two <laughs> filmmakers, two dancers, two visual artists, like let's get two of every species of, because the arts, the arts is so, there's so many art. When we say art, it's not just visual arts, it's singing, it's dancing, it, it is theater, it's all of the arts. And that afternoon was amazing. We opened up with a simple question, when did the arts, did the arts ever, affect you or change your life. And the stories were so amazing. And then we had the neuroscientists there to talk about why that was happening. And then Susan looked at me afterwards and said, I've always wanted to write a book about this. Do you want to do this with me? And I'm like, this is so the book I've been waiting for because my entire career, whenever I would win design awards, publishers would come out of the woodwork saying, you should write a book on creativity and innovation. And that never appealed to me because that's, I live that. And for me, a project like this also had to be a learning journey. And that's what it's been together. How beautiful. And thank you for doing it. And it took four years to work on this, right? I mean, you worked, you've been working at this for a while. Well, luckily, because of COVID, the truth is this book only got done because of COVID, because I usually commute to work three hours a day. And so, and because Susan's on the East Coast, I'm on the West Coast, every morning from like 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. my time, California time, I was able to work for her and then work for Google from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. Um, so between the writing of the proposal, which to get that right took about a year, mm -hmm. um, and then a year to write it, and then a year um, to uh, actually, yeah, it's about three years. Wow. Total. Well, congrats. I mean, as I was reading it, so much of it is so relatable. So there's obviously all the science and the research, and, and you're going to help us unpack that today. But then when you were sharing the stories, I was just relating so much, so much back to my life. I'm surrounded by two highly creative people. I would say my daughter is like, uh, she was born for the arts. That's truly her calling. Uh, she's already won like awards and stuff. She just did a documentary. Now I feel like she's going to be like, don't brag about me on your podcast. She doesn't like when I talk about her. She's 14. But she did a 10 minute documentary talking about the carte de visite. And its impact on the Civil War. So she combined her love of history with also arts and photography and created this thing. And now is going to a state level to compete. And it's like when I read how much it impacts your health and your well being, and I think, oh, good, because she's not a sports kid. <laughs> I mean, the sports are important <laughs> too. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's just interesting. And then I was thinking about how when I was getting body work done in Boston, when I lived there, I was getting something called Jin Shin Jitsu which is a form of, do you know what it is? It's a hands-on yes, healing yes. that's not acupuncture. And yes. the guy that used to do it would play his digital roo in the beginning, 
just to ground the session and then we would mm-hmm. go in. So there were so many like ahas with it, but mm-hmm. I want to bring this to the audience so they have an understanding of what we're talking about because you wrote it and now I've read this amazing book. Um, so let's just start with just, you you touched upon it a little bit, Susan, but just so we have all are coming from the same place, just definition, neuroaesthetics, neuro arts, just sure. a foundation. Yeah. Sure. So neuroaesthetics, I always say is such a big word, um, but it really is quite simple that it's the study of how the arts and aesthetic experiences measurably change your body, brain, and behavior. And very importantly, how the knowledge can be translated into specific practices to advance health, well-being, learning, community building, flourishing. And we call the field neuroarts. Uh, neuroaesthetics is the research, uh, how we describe the research. Okay, that's perfect. And you can, I'm just going to read just a little bit from your book because you kind of opened it up this way and this resonated. And I think it will for my audience. It says, you know, the transformative power of art. You've gotten lost in music and a painting and a movie or a play, and you felt something shift within you. You've read a book so compelling that you pressed it into the hands of a friend. You heard a song so moving. You listened to it over and over, memorizing every word. The arts bring joy, inspiration, well-being, understanding, even salvation. And while these experiences may not be easy to explain, you have always known they are real and true, but now we have scientific proof that the arts are essential to our very survival. Can you elaborate on this? I mean, one of the things you talk about in the book is that we can actually extend our life by 10 years just by participating in art once a month. Can can you help us understand like just how profound art is? Because I think people think of it as like, oh, she's good at art or he's good at art. I can't do this. So I'm yeah. not even going to try. A nice to have, not a have to have. Totally. You know, having you read that to us was really a gift because uh, I think we wrote that about 50 times <laughs> because we really wanted to make get the reader in that moment, because we've all experienced the arts in such extraordinary ways. But in some ways, that has become invisible for us. We've become so um, uh, operationalizing that we forget how valuable and how life-changing that is. And when we started to pull forward the uh, work around the science of the arts or or, or how the arts change us, uh, Again, it it makes so much sense. Uh, Just kind of a couple ways to come at that. First, we bring the world in through our senses. So all of the ways that um, things that are happening around us have to come in through scent, smell, taste, touch, sound. There's no other way that the world can enter us. And when it does enter us, it really interacts with an incredible um, array of neurons. We have over a hundred billion neurons that we're born with, and those synapse those those neurons connect through synapses to create neural pathways. So you have quadrillions of neural pathways throughout your brain that connect all of the different systems that create multiple mechanisms. So how do you process learning? How do you process memory? How do you, how are you creative? How do you even move your arms and legs? How do you create emotion? All of those things happen because of these neural pathways that are created in your, in your brain. Turns out that the arts and aesthetic experiences are the most salient types of experiences because they create meaning, they create a sense of purpose. There's things that we remember. Mm. So, which is why it's so easy to remember your favorite song when you were 13 or or, or your favorite color. Um, these things create almost a fingerprint, an autobiographical imprint on your brain and body that become who you are. And I, I think, you know, it's so wonderful that your daughter is using the arts for self-expression and for bringing her ideas into the world. And it's fantastic that she's really good at it. But one of the I think mythologies that Ivy and I found in the in, in doing the research is that for people who are great at it, the arts are so great for mental health and physical health and well-being and flourishing. It's also true that they're equally as good for people who aren't talented and aren't gifted and aren't going to be uh, filmmakers or musicians in the future. But the skills that they're learning and making actually do transfer into being very significant for impact and also transfer for other areas in our lives. And, you know, the truth is we looked back into 
in ancient times, like with indigenous culture, there was no separate word for art. Storytelling, dancing, singing, painting, it was life. It was culture. And that's our true nature. And somehow we started optimizing for productivity and pushed the arts aside and thinking that productivity would make us happy. And I think it's shown that it hasn't. It needs, you know, it's and both. It's not either or. So I think it's time that we we went back a little bit to advance us forward is what we need to do and look at reclaim what is our birthright. And through working with Susan, I, you know, we really are, I've learned, we are wired for art. I mean, that is the way our physiology is wired. So the fact that we've pushed it aside or only the people who think they are good at it do it, um, that's what we want to, we want to change that myth. And I'm so glad that you are. I mean, as you're both talking, it's so much is resonating uh, both with, like I said, living with two highly creative people, my husband and my daughter, and just dismissing anything that I've done, whether writing poetry, writing songs, all of that is, oh, that's tucked away and hidden somewhere, even though it brings me so much. And also, just like you said, the the history with cultures and just it's a part of our DNA that we've uh, we've we've pushed to the side as well, like you said, in order to be more productive and valuable and check things off our to-do list and feel productive versus feeling truly fulfilled, which the arts can truly do, just like you talk about, even just seeing a painting or hearing a song, we get the goosebumps. And it's like, it's literally, we're wired for this and so exciting. Um, list some ways that people can be creative because you mentioned you know like in the book knitting i mean maybe people aren't even thinking of that as one of the the areas can you just 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 to get people thinking about the arts and maybe how they can incorporate it themselves well i talk about high touch low tech um ways that the that what we call the arts can be really immediately useful and and some of them um you go ah i do that um humming in the shower um, i'm a serial shower singer and i and i've sing very badly, um, singing in the car, um, doodling. It turns out that doodling is one of the most productive ways to focus your attention and to also be able to recall information. And doodlers are much more attentive and focused than non-doodlers. Uh, writing poetry, as you said, or expressive writing, just writing in a journal. Uh, there's some great research out of University of Texas, Austin, by a, a researcher named James Pennebaker, who talks about how when you put a secret down on a piece of paper, even if you rip it up or burn it, just the act of expressing those feelings lightens your cognitive load and actually increases uh, your uh, sense of ease and lowers cortisol. And so something as simple as just putting it out there, not even sharing it. Uh, there's also some you know, really great work that's being done around uh, dancing and stress. Um, and again, you don't have to be a great dancer in order to, to be able to do that. I think, you know, a lot of this comes down to expressing ourselves. I think we've been, we um, sometimes have been taught to repress our feelings. And through a lot of these arts, you get to let that out. And there's a great um, quote by Julie Bolte Taylor, who says that we think we are thinking beings who have learned how to feel and we're actually feeling beings who think. Mm. And when you, when you think about that, it turns everything on its head. If we are first and foremost feeling beings, which um, I think we've learned through the biology and that that is the way we're wired and that's our birthright, who have learned how to think but I think we do walk around thinking we're thinking beings who once in a while feel. And because we've been told sometimes, and sometimes when we're younger, you know, not to express how we feel. And so the art, some of the reasons why it's also good for us is that it releases some of that, um, that we've been holding. Mm -hmm. And it's especially even in trauma, you know, there's a lot of work that Susan could talk about around trauma, significant trauma, but we have micro traumas every day. And we don't, we just keep holding them, holding them, holding them until one day it explodes. Mm -hmm. So using the arts to get rid of that trauma, there's a story in a book with a young fireman who, a woman who started Art to Ashes, who was taking frontline firemen and who would come out of the fire with trauma from seeing that person they couldn't save, leaving them behind. And in the past, they would go home to their families and take it out on the families. 
she gave him a paintbrush and you know started painting as soon as they came out of the fire. And the young man talks about, I go home and I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Mm -hmm. And so that young man is now going to other fire departments and teaching them how to do certain arts as a release for the trauma and stress they've experienced. Wow. You know, we're also seeing college students forming knitting circles and uh, crocheting circles and coming together um, because we know that using our hands in, in that, that way actually also reduces anxiety and helps to manage stress and also helps to relieve um, a sense of loneliness and build a sense of belonging. So you're starting to see these different communities use arts in service of, in this case, mental health, which is a huge problem in um, young children and also in adolescents and college students. And so, you know, when you can use these collaging is another area where uh, kids are using collaging to help really just get their Get, get out what they're feeling and then come back and put words to what they're, what they're doing, what they're thinking. Yes. Yeah. Because Susan and I learned even in with the young children in third world countries or war where there's war, you know, they use, they, when there are no words to express how you're feeling, just giving a child a crayon and letting them draw the whole story of how they're feeling comes out on the piece of paper. Mm. So it's a beautiful modality to get things out that can't be expressed sometimes. Oh, it's so fascinating. Well, now I'm curious a little bit about the sort of the science and the brain a little bit more as you're talking about, like even when you're talking about the knitting and I'm thinking about how you're using your both hands and I don't know how that impacts neural pathways and the different parts of the brain or like, uh, you know, you talked about singing or humming or like, so now the sounds. So I, and so I'm obviously, this is not my background. So if it's a dumb question, you can tell me, but just, I don't know if this is about the rewiring or the saliency or like the biology. Can you just sort of help us understand maybe like what's happening in the brain so that we can kind of maybe connect it to why it's so powerful? Sure. Um, I think one easy way to enter it is that uh, the way that the arts um, enter our brain is they affect us both physiologically and psychologically and multiple systems within our brains are activated sometimes at the same time. So it isn't a, you know, point A to point B. Um, so, you know, we may be in an experience, let me use something like um, entering into a room. Well, your sense of all of your senses are engaged. Um, your limbic system is engaged. Your motor system is engaged. Your probably your reward system is engaged. Um, maybe in a prefrontal part of your brain, you are um, analyzing and sort of putting into shape um, sort of what a process is that you might do when you're a space. So all of these things are being activated simultaneously. And that also um, triggers your heart, your lungs, mm -hmm. your vascular system. So you're highly physiologically and psychologically engaged in that. And so what I, what I, when I talk about, you know, the arts in terms of neurobiology, I sort of often will say, think of it as an elephant in the room. The elephant is very ancient. It's very old and it's very big. And depending upon where you're hit touching the elephant, you're actually tapping into some part of that experience. Mm -hmm. and, and let me let me give you a couple of examples. Singing and humming activate the vagus nerve and they also engage the parasympathetic nervous system. Uh, when you are dancing for Parkinson's, you're actually activating gait and you're activating um mood enhancers and reward. And, you know, Parkinson's is interesting because Parkinson's patients lose dopamine. Mm -hmm. So dopamine is that feel good hormone. But what happens is they're not actually creating more dopamine. They're actually switching in now serotonin and maybe oxytocin and other neurotransmitters and hormones are coming into play so that they actually are feeling better, even though they don't have that neurotransmitter that originally was, was the one that is mostly responsible or seen mostly responsible for reward. Um, you also mentioned clay. So when you're using pottery and you're making pottery, clay is one of the few mediums that we know of where both hands are working um, at the same level of dexterity. Mm -hmm. And so studies have been showing uh, psychological benefits of using clay 
the way you break it down and start again, the tactile quality reduces negative moods and anxiety. And it also helps us to focus and working with clay releases serotonin. It also helps us to sort of have more of an optimistic outlook. And so you can, I think there's some very, we talked about mental health, talked a little bit about some of the physical, practical things that arts can do. Uh, you know, arts like uh, virtual reality can be very helpful for reducing pain or uh, for helping uh, students who are struggling with ADHD. So th- I would say there's an art for that. Um, but the mechanisms and the ways that those arts are working call on a cascade, a huge cascade of different types of neurotransmitters, neural pathways, and parts of the brain that are activated depending upon what we're working toward. Love it. Did you want to add something, Avi, to that? Or? No, I was going to say, and also what we learned is why you know doctors are writing prescriptions for patients to go to museums because with now that we understand your brain and neuroplasticity is constantly making these new connections, putting yourself in front of um, new imagery, doing things you haven't done before, that is constantly making new connections new neural pathways and actually pruning some of the old ones. Mm. So it's almost, you think of it as a garden analogy. You're, you constantly want to be planting new seeds, having new flowers grow and getting rid of the old ones. So it's, our brains are super dynamic. So as Susan said earlier, these salient experiences, these ones that have an emotional reaction by looking at a painting or stepping into a sculpture, you know, will make new connections for our brain that are memorable. So it's important to even be out there as the beholder of some of these arts, Mm. not just making them at home yourself. I love it. And you do talk about wonder and awe and how we're, we're again, programmed to want that or respond to that and how all of our senses can get engaged. And um, I think of children and how they explore the world with that curiosity and wanting to engage all their senses as well. We are hardwired it seems to do this and then we just condition ourselves to sit in the chair all day and get all tight and uncomfortable and and, yeah. and not move and not and you know do those things except maybe in those quiet moments like you mentioned Susan in the shower I think many of us do sing or in the car you know and then we can find that we are relaxing right yeah we're yep. more grounded when we allow for that well this idea of play is actually how we get to creativity and innovation you know kids the idea is that you do something different than your normal routine without an end outcome. And that's the key thing. Play doesn't have an objective. You know, I think so much often in our day, everything we do is a ta- has an end goal. Yes. But play is you venture into something without any end goal in mind and you just, you just play and you see what happens. Yes. And so, you know, even, um, through my work with design teams, I've used that technique. And you find that you you come up with great ideas when you don't worry about what the end result is. I but I think this that's why we say we love to invite people to play with the arts without worrying about, am I going to be good at it? Is there, you know, putting that judgment there? And you'd be surprised what happens. Absolutely. You, you made me think of something when you said for people to just relax. And I love that because you know, there's a a part of the brain called the default mode network. Mm. And it's considered the neurobiological basis of the self. Um, It's that part of the brain that makes meaning of things, um, connects the dots that helps to find patterns. You know, we're we're such pattern making machines and and, and to to make sense of the world. And so um, what's interesting about the default mode network is that in order for the default mode network to do its job, you need to be quiet it's when you're not letting stimuli in. Mm. Um, it's what it's so it's that place where you're still and you're just being. And you know we're all so active, we're all so busy. But the space called the default mode network is where we daydream and mind wander mm. and think to ourselves. And I think that's such an important place for us to give ourselves permission to go to, um, so that we really know kind of where we are in the world and what does have meaning to us. And to understand that even though we think we're doing nothing, we're actually being productive because it's actually letting what we've taken in sink in and have meaning for us. 
I love this. Oh, this is so good. And it's also so grounding. I, mem- I remember during COVID, felt like the whole country just got split, right? It just, there was so much division. And I remember just feeling just a sadness and I couldn't shake it. And I was like, what's going on? And a, a poem about the about a life of meaning flowed out of me. And when I read the poem, and I, I've shared it on Instagram, uh, I think literally today might have been, it was two years ago today, I think that it just, I was crying because it was a release for me mm-hmm. and it healed something that needed to be healed that I couldn't do myself. But when I read the words, I couldn't have conceived the words. Does that make sense? Like I couldn't yes. have written that if I tried, like with this end result is I'm going to write a poem so I can feel mm-hmm. better. No, mm-hmm. it was just words came out and sometimes it's song, but in this case it was words and it was kind of deep. And I was like, it came through me. So what is that about? I mean, cause I mean, I feel like this is a part of what we're talking about. I, I think it is too. Uh, you know, I think that we so undervalue uh the ways that our bodies know yeah. and and in some ways we're vessels, right? So I I've had those experiences where something has come out of me that I didn't know was there and it informs me. It comes back to me yes. and and it's extraordinary. Um, you know, you know a lot about the flow state. And you know, I don't I don't want to reduce what I what you just shared as being um well, here's why that happened. But I think <laughs> this this idea of the flow state is actually really important for all of us. Yes. You know, when we get ourselves into that place where things are coming through us. It's timeless. It's effortless. There is no judgment. We're allowed to really use our true nature to be able to put ourselves out into the world, which is really hard to do authentically and honestly. So when those moments, I call them perfect moments, when those perfect moments happen, it's just like, um, it's an honor, right? It's a blessing. It's a gift. And so I think, you know, you're in a flow state when that's happening. And that's something that um, is primarily prefrontal. You turn off your judgment, your criticism, and you just let things go. And again, we don't all, often that can happen when we're on our knees, right? When we're in grief or in tragedy or in loss, where You give yourself over to something greater than yourself, Mm. whatever you believe in. And I think there's something so um, uh, gratifying about and sacred about that. Mm. I love the word sacred because it feels like a connection to the oneness. When you talked about, I mean, how we're just, this was our truth of sharing stories and singing and dance. It was just a part of being. That was like a connection to oneness and community. Yeah, it was the feeling of something greater than ourselves. Yes. And that's the way in which we kept that feeling going. And I think now we've lost that. And some sometimes we get it back. Um, you know, when we look at a sunset, every all of a sudden when it's magnificent, you feel that there's something bigger than yourself. Yes. So we have to find those moments, whereas I think we used to know them all the time. Yes. Okay. Well, we're so, inside so much too, right? We used to be well, outside 99.9% of the time. I have to add one thing to what Ivy said. We were fortunate to talk with E.O. Wilson, the evolutionary biologist, right before he died. And he told us something that I never knew before. Uh, and it's that like ants and bees, uh, we are what's called eusocial. Uh, There aren't that many species, maybe six, use social species. And what it means is that we need each other to survive. We we, we can't survive as a species if we aren't helping each other. And so awe and wonder, curiosity, this idea of being that the world is bigger than us individually, all those feelings, those aesthetic feelings really are part of our survival, what's kept us alive for millennia. And I think re-engaging with those is probably what's going to keep, keep us alive for the next millennia. Well, yeah, if we if we connect back to it, because I think we've gotten very, sometimes a little selfish and greedy as individuals. 
It's truly. And I underline that part in the book, Susan, because I was I was like, wait, we're like termites. <laughs> we have that. They yeah, were we one are. of the species. I was like, bees, I, I for some reason I didn't mind being compared to the bees, but the, the termites, because <laughs> we have those in, in California. <laughs> yes, um, but, yeah. <laughs> but it's very, it's it's fascinating. Okay, so one of the parts of the book that I found the most interesting, and you've touched upon it a little bit with the Parkinson's and the dance, is how the arts are being used to help with health disorders. You mentioned mental illness, you know, other illnesses, including like Alzheimer's. You share a story of a father who remembers his son's name after hearing familiar music to him. So where are we going? I mean, is this like the way to prevent? I mean, this, I don't, I'm not going to have you project, but based on your research, maybe you can share an example of like just how profound the arts is to our, either our mental health or our, you know, our brain health or physical health, you know, maybe one story or, or something from the research would be really helpful. Well, let me tell the story of um, Connie Tamaro, who is uh, a creative arts therapist, music therapist. And um, in the 70s, I think she started to bring her guitar into residential programs with people with Alzheimer's and dementia. Yep. And the nurses would say, oh, Connie, that's so sweet. That's so nice. Um, but by the end of an hour, she would have people who were uh, not able to speak singing the songs of their youth. And it was quite profound. I, I think it's the closest thing to magic I've ever seen when you literally someone see someone awaken to Puff the Magic Dragon, an amazing grace, and you are my sunshine. And um, it's just amazing. It's amazing to see. Well, Connie caught the attention of Oliver Sacks, and Oliver Sacks also couldn't believe this and started to really do more research around it. And what uh, neurobiologists and cognitive scientists are now understanding about the role of music and bio -auto autobiographical music and personalized music is that the way our brains uh, lay down code and encode memory when we're 14, 15, 16, 25, in those very highly salient times in our lives where we're building identity and we're making associations, those memories first are stored in the hippocampus, the short-term memory, but then they move into multiple parts of the brain uh, around emotion and around um, uh, uh, sense of self, around um, how we problem solve. And as we as we start to lose our hippocampus, which is one of the areas that tends to um, deteriorate very early on with dementia, uh, we're able to still pull those things, those memories, that music from other parts of our brain to wake us up, to mm -hmm. light us up, to make it recognized. And I think that might be one of the most extraordinary things that we see with um, music in particular, with Parkinson's. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, because we're losing dopamine, we have to figure out our brains are sort of hacking the system and are figuring out how to call on different uh, parts of the brain to continue to have motor-based um, changes in gait or cognition or sleep. And this idea around quality of life really, really changes dramatically when you're able to move where you haven't been able to move before. Um, and these are just a couple of, of examples. Um, also with light and sound, mm. uh, there's researchers in Boston that are studying, um, they've been working in animal models and now they're moving it into clinical trials with people using light and sound, in this case, 40 hertz of sound, and specific types of optogenetics to go right at amyloid and plaque. And they've gotten really amazing results. So, you know, music is sound, right? And so um, thinking about how you harness these, these sensorial experiences to help to address the progression of, in this case, dementia. Wow. Did you have anything to add to that, Ivy? No, other than Susan uh, encouraged my husband and I to share playlists now with each other of our favorite music. And that was a great recommendation. So God forbid we ever fall into a coma or something that I now understand why that would be so important is for us each to have each other's favorite music. Mm, gosh, I'm getting goosebumps from a lot of what you guys are, what you're both talking about. Um, I'm just, there's a viral video of a woman who uh, is, who has 
Alzheimer's and her grandson plays for her Swan Lake. Have you seen this? I oh have. my God. Yeah, it's, yeah. And her, her oh. arms start going. I just start just crying. I mean, it's just so beautiful that those she, connections. Um, yeah. Immediately that music triggers this memory. And, and it's the, in this case, it's not just even, it's not singing. It's her hands her were so beautiful. Yeah. They were, they were like a young prima ballerina and here is this old woman in a in a wheelchair and yet her hand movements were as graceful as a 22 year old it was absolutely magnificent do you think that it's preventative do you think that if we're engaging i mean I, i'm not asking you to project but it just seems that it is so powerful if we can extend our life by 10 years just by engaging once a month for what 45 minutes then what if we are making a daily practice i mean it's easy we can hum we can sing right i just just love your thoughts yeah, I mean, I, I think so with the Parkinson's work during COVID, uh, there's a group, uh, Mark Morris Dance Company has something called um, Dance for PD. Mm -hmm. And people would come into a dance studio all over the country, but they come in, you know, they take the train, a bus, a car, very hard to get there. Um, and they dance with their peers. Mm. During COVID, they couldn't go. So Mark Morris put this up on uh, Zoom. And literally millions of people around the world started to dance. Oh, wow. um, sometimes people would dance with their family members in another country or another city or another house because they couldn't get together. And so this, in essence, became a really interesting opportunity for data. And what they saw was that people were dancing more often. They were dancing um, more times a day. And the benefits were actually increasing uh, the residual effects of um gait and mood and sleep being better over longer periods of time. And so, you know, like we take medication every day for certain things. Why can't you take a prescription of dance every day? And, you know, we don't have the long-term answers for that yet, but I think it's pretty easy to understand that the more you do something, the more benefit, the better, you know, interest to in mastery is a term in, in, um, in learning, but the more you do it, the more it's going to help you feel better in, in these cases. And so I think there's something to be said for that. We think about the arts um, from the NIH's point perspective, the National Institutes of Health as complementary and integrative. And so this is not to say it's an either or, but a yeah. yes and, but for resiliency, for per that per sec, uh, for for protection and prevention for young children, absolutely. The arts are helping to build strong neural pathways that create longer resiliency, that create more ability to be able to have capacities to meet whatever life brings our way. I think as interventions, they are incredibly helpful. Um, and I think as a practice, a daily practice, they help to keep us well and feeling that we have a sense of meaning. So I think there's lots of ways the arts really can help us. Um, and a cure, you know, I think who knows, right? Who knows what the future is going to bring? Yeah. Ivy, is there anything you want to add on that? Or? No, I, <clears throat> I would say one of my sound teachers even talks about a future where instead of taking vitamins, because um, that's frequency, and that we would be having a song composed just for us that has the musical frequencies that our body needs. And so we would, we would, instead of taking vitamins, we would listen to this song that was composed, <clears throat> sorry, just to put our body back in homeostasis. So I love, I'll sign up for that world. 100%. Um, I know we're coming to the end of the time and I could ask you both so many more questions, but um, I'll ask just if, is there anything that I, I mean, again, like I would love to go a little bit deeper, but <laughs> I want to be respectful of time. Is there anything I didn't ask? Um, that you think is important to just touch upon in terms of, you know, why you wrote this book and getting it out there, what you keep, you know, you hope people take away or anything that I didn't, we didn't get to touch upon that you, you do want everyone listening to, to hear today. Yeah, well, I I'll chime in first here. I think that just like science has finally ingrained in us that exercising 20 minutes a day is good for our health and eight hours of sleep is good for our health. We wrote this book hoping that people would understand that 20, add to your diet 20 minutes a day of doing some art activity or being the beholder of art, and it will change your health and well being. Love it. Susan? And, and since Ivy's um, gone to the individual, I'll go to the collective. 
Uh, you know, the World Bank says that without strong and diverse cultures, economies can't grow, inner healing, health and well-being suffer, and opportunities are lost. And I think because we are such social creatures that biologically evolved to belong to something greater than ourselves, we need to remember that. Um, in the book, we say art creates culture, culture creates community, and community creates humanity. So dance more, sing more, write more. Um, can really use the arts in service of your life because we're evolutionarily wired for it. Absolutely. And I hope we bring that back to the children because as you said, Ivy, they're not outside, so they're not getting the the, the nature piece. And, you know, kids naturally are going to move and explore and stuff. And we're just trying to get them into these little boxes. And they're yeah, the teachers, I think. They're doing it right. We're the ones messing it up. Absolutely. And they're our future. So I think it has to start there. Yeah. Um, where can people learn mo more about your work and get access to the book? Where do you like to to hang out and have people be directed to? Where, where should I send them? Well, our website, yourbrainonart.com is a great place. And on that website, it has places you can buy the book, but it's available um, now for pre-order. It comes out March 21st at most bookstores, but on that website is some links that you could click on. Also, we have some articles you know, people might be interested in certain aspects of what we've talked about because it's such a vast subject. So, um, so I would say that and our, our Instagram, which is your brain on art book, uh, are two good places. Yeah. And, well, and I was going to say, you know, we started um, our journey by asking um, the Noah's Ark crowd um, what art moved them. And, uh, and on our website in the contact us area, we're inviting people to share their stories because we really want to understand um, the kind of global family of how the arts and aesthetic experience has really changed. So write us. Thank you. Um, again, the book is Your Brain on Art, How the Arts Transform Us. It's an amazing book. I, like I said, I just, I marked up so much of it. And a lot of the stories you talked about were things that I had underlined and wanted to go back to. It's just, you're going to learn so much, but incorporate it take the challenge in 20 minutes. I feel like we all have that in our hearts to want to do anyway. I am so grateful to both you, Susan and Ivy, for just the work you're doing and bringing awareness around this because it's so important and you're bringing us back to our truth of who Absolutely. we are. And so I think everyone's going to feel that just hearing what you talked about today and after they read the book and learn more about you. So thank you from my heart to yours for the work that you're doing. I'm so grateful to both of you and for your time today. You're both such powerhouse women and I feel really honored to be sitting with you. Oh, thank you. And thank you for bringing this information to your audience. Thank yes, you. thank you so much. Really wonderful. Thank you. All of the show notes for today's interview can be found over at thegoodlifecoach.com. I encourage you to uh, look up Susan and Ivy's book, their website, look into the work they're doing. And just I'm just excited about the research and all the data that leads to what intuitively feels right, that art is a part of who we are and we should feel encouraged to incorporate it, even if that means singing at the top of our lungs, even if we are not technically singers and just embracing the art for the simple joy and clearly the health benefits that it brings us. So thank you so much for tuning in today. And I hope you will share this with everyone you know. This is for every person out there and just such an interesting conversation. So thanks for tuning in today. And I look forward to being back with you next Wednesday. Bye for now. Thanks so much for tuning in today. I hope you gain some new information or inspiration for your life. That is that the essence of this show is to really wake up to what's possible for you to reclaim your beautiful voice and to really learn to love and prioritize yourself. So if you gained any value from any of the conversations you've tuned into, Make sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast player. You can do that right now on your phone. And please do consider leaving a rating and review if you have yet to do so on Apple Podcasts. It's actually how more women can find the show. And I really want to grow a community of women who are loving themselves and living full on. So thank you as always for tuning in. And I look forward to reconnecting with you next Wednesday. Bye for now. Bye.